systems. So we learn all those same basic things, but at the same time in cardiology, when we're learning how to, how to prescribe a high blood pressure medication and what's the you know, algorithm that you work patients through, it's also on the side we're saying, okay, what herbs could we do for this person? What lifestyle interventions can we do for this person? Um, you know, if a medication is needed, how do we get off of that medication eventually? So um, really looking at like the whole well-rounded treatment plan versus just working them through a medical algorithm of medications. Hello, and welcome to the Art of Living Well podcast. I'm Stephanie May Potter, and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Dotches marmette We created the Art of Living Well podcast to empower you to live your happiest, healthiest, and most authentic life. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and motivating conversations covering health and wellness topics, including fitness, mindset, food, travel, product reviews, and strategies from a variety of experts, including our own bank of knowledge. We are excited to educate, motivate, and inspire you to change the way you perceive health and discover your art of living well. Get ready to feel inspired. Today's podcast is brought to you by Beekeepers Naturals, the company on a mission to reinvent your medicine cabinet by creating clean and natural remedies that actually work. I started using Beekeepers Naturals a couple years ago after hearing about them on a podcast. And I just loved how effective they worked. They're clean, non-toxic, and natural ingredients. The company's obsessive research and their pesticide testing, as well as their mission to support the pollinators. I just started using their propolis spray and I absolutely love it. The throat spray is really your daily dose of defense when it comes to naturally supporting your immune system and soothing a scratchy throat. With just three simple ingredients, the spray is powered by sustainably sourced bee propolis, an incredible germ fighter that contains over 300 beneficial compounds. It's exactly what your body needs when you, during cold and flu season. And I just love this spray. I use it every morning. It's super easy to use. I just spray it like right in my mouth and off I go and it tastes good. And um, I love how they do all this research and testing and their remedies are so clean and effective. Another product we love is the Bee Chill Honey. We all get stressed out, right? But a dose of the bee chill can help take the edge off. It's great at bedtime. You can put a spoonful of it in your tea to help you toss and turn less. I've actually been doing that most nights. I've been putting a little scoop in my tea and mixing it up and it tastes so good and it's so calming. And it just, I love um, having that at the end of the night to just kind of relax me before I go to bed. And a couple other of their honey products are so great. You can buy the Bee Chill in travel size sticks. And so I recently went on a trip and brought it with me. I used it in my tea. I use it uh, in my plain yogurt. And I just have to add that their superfood cacao honey is delicious. I make these chocolate protein balls with it and they're so good. I actually just made them last night. Now that we're going into winter, it's a great time to upgrade your, upgrade your medicine cabinet and stock it with immune supporting products. To save 15% off on your first order, go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash art of living well. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S.com slash A-R-T. O-F-L-I-V-I-N-G-W-E-L-L to save 15% off. Simply enter the code Art of Living Well at checkout and shop now for 15% off our favorite immune supporting products that your whole family will love. Hello and welcome to episode number 53 of the Art of Living Well podcast. Before I introduce today's guest, we have a request for everyone. We would love for you to head on over to Apple Podcast and give the Art of Living Well podcast a rating and review. We would so appreciate it. It really helps our podcast get found in searches and allows more people from around the world to benefit from the resources and information and inspiration that we share every week. 
If you haven't already, we'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast. And of course, please share this episode or any others with a friend or anyone you think could benefit from the information. And finally, we'd love for you to tag us on social media, follow us on Instagram and Facebook, share your favorite episodes so that more people just like you can be inspired to find their art of living well. We are thrilled to bring you today's guest, Dr. Cassie Wilder. She is one of the first naturopathic medical doctors to open up a practice in the Twin Cities. Dr. Cassie is a registered naturopathic medical doctor, and her passion is empowering her patients through education, understanding, and support through their healing journey. After graduating from Iowa State University with a Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology and Health, Dr. Wilder earned her Doctorate of Naturopathic Medicine from Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and Health Sciences. During her clinical training, she received extensive hands-on training with many leading experts in the field of functional medicine and developed a passion for treating hormonal imbalances, thyroid disorders, cardiovascular concerns, and adrenal fatigue. Dr. Wilder specializes in preventative cardiology that allows for early detection and treatment of cardiovascular conditions such as coronary artery disease and hypertension. Dr. Wilder emphasizes individualized patient care and employs a variety of modalities in order to tailor treatments to the patient's needs. She believes in an integrative approach to medicine and is up to date on conventional treatments to disease as well as naturopathic and will integrate seamlessly into your healthcare team. So in today's conversation, we talk about a variety of topics, including hormone health in women, symptoms that indicate that your hormones are out of balance, and natural ways that we can support our bodies to obtain equilibrium. Dr. Cassie shares with us the symptoms that are normal during your menstrual cycle and which debilitating symptoms aren't, because we know there are many women walking around experiencing these unwanted symptoms that they deem to be normal, and they have lived with them their entire life. Bottom line, your period should be a non-event, and it shouldn't prevent you from going to work or having you cancel your social plans. But no, we don't just talk about women's health and periods. We dive into immune support and what we can be doing right now to support our immunity, which is something that we're all focused on during this pandemic and in particularly during cold and flu season. Dr. Cassie shares some of these recommendations that we can do to keep our immune system strong, including which supplements she recommends. We also talk about teens and PMS symptoms, um, PCOS, infertility, and so much more. So we know you're going to love this episode. And with that, let's dive right into our conversation with Dr. Cassie Wilder. Dr. Cassie, we are so excited to have you on the Art of Living Well podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time for our conversation. We really can't wait to share your expertise with our audience. We know that many women suffer from a lot of unwanted um, symptoms related to hormonal imbalance issues. So we'll definitely be touching on that. And, you know, I remember we met just through Instagram, you know, which is (laughs) one of the benefits of social media. And I found your feed and just immediately resonated with so much of the information that you shared and your approach to health and wellness that we ultimately had coffee um, in the North Loop in Minneapolis. And I knew you immediately had to come on our podcast to share your wisdom with our audience. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, it was a great coffee date. That was uh, almost a year ago, wasn't it? It was almost a year ago. And you you had a baby and you've had a lot going on. Oh, (laughs) yeah. Um, So let's just start out today, if you can share a little bit about your background and your story that led you to enter naturopathic medicine and ultimately open up your own practice here in Minneapolis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, Um, went to Iowa, got Iowa State, actually got my bachelor's at Iowa State, went, and then basically I've wanted to be a doctor for as long as I've ever been. I've ever known, you know, at my brief stint, I laughed that I wanted to be Elle Woods for a little bit, like Lily Blonde. I want to be a lawyer. (laughs) Yeah. And then I realized that was a bad idea. So I went back to medicine and I did a rotation with the gastroenterologist in Ames, Iowa. And it was really eye opening to me to see um, how wonderful if you really needed, like, are we working up colon cancer? do you have something really incredibly wrong with you um, that we have a system in place that really can help with that? But then we were really, um, 
I don't want to say failing patients, but kind of. We were really disappointing patients who just came in with, you know, gas and bloating and, you know, abdominal pains that weren't related to a terrible pathology. And um, just the level that the gastroenterologist didn't really know what to do with them. Um, you know, he would kind of say, well, we don't ask about what they eat because that's the dietitian's job. We don't ask um, what they do for self-care because that's not our job. We don't do that. And I kind of thought to myself, what the hell do we do? We're doctors. Like, <laughs> of course, it, of course, like we need to know these different types of things about these patients. And it basically led me to realize that as medical doctors in the medical system, that's not their role. And that's, that's what our, that's what we're using them for when in reality, that's not what they do best. And it really led me to seek other options and other, um, places in the healthcare system where I would fit in a little bit better as a person who really did want to get into like, are you meditating? Are you dealing with your stress? Well, are you exercising? How are you eating? Are you drinking toxic water? Like what, it, what are some different foundations to health that um, we need to address that I just wouldn't be able to address in a conventional medical system. So I found out about naturopathic medicine a and I actually applied in November, interviewed at the beginning of December, and enrolled and started like January 1st of that, say, of that next year. So basically, it was like a three-month process, and I was, I was hooked, and I started, and I have been incredibly happy with my career choice ever since. So I feel like I was like made to do this job, and I love it. So yeah, that's so awesome. That's great. And can you, for those people that don't fully understand maybe the differences between more traditional, oh sure, um, Western medicine versus in your, your field and being a naturopathic doctor. Can you just give us a quick um, high sure. level overview of the differences? Yeah, so we still have a four level, a four year accredited program where we have to take two sets of boards, do a certain amount of clinical shifts, do a certain amount of outside shifts. So we do a lot of the similar things that are in a traditional medical school. We learn all about how to work you up for really bad things, how to run labs, how to read MRIs, how to when to refer to, for the emergency room. Like we learn how to prescribe drugs. In a lot of states, we can actually prescribe pharmaceuticals, not Minnesota, but um, a lot of other ones. So we learn all those same basic things. But at the same time, in cardiology, when we're learning how to, how to prescribe a high blood pressure medication and what's the you know, algorithm that you work patients through, it's also on the side we're saying, okay, what herbs could we do for this person? What lifestyle interventions can we do for this person? Um, you know, if a medication is needed, how do we get off of that medication eventually? So um, really looking at like the whole well-rounded treatment plan versus just working them through a medical algorithm of medications. So that's things that we learned in school. We learned nutrition, botanical medicine, Chinese medicine. We learned how to adjust, although I would never try to do that again. Um, and we learn, oh God, so like just so many things that are like all piled on top of everything. So, And it's really about treating the patient from the inside out, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of meeting them where they are. You know, some people, I have patients where they're extremely insulin resistant, have diabetes, extremely, you know, overweight, have really bad lipids. And right then and there, they need more conventional medicine than natural medicine. And so it's up to me to recognize that and recommend the correct things, but then also put that long-term plan in place of how do we get you back to normal without any of these medications, if that's your goal. So. So what about your practice, your approach, your specialty? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I really became hooked on women's health and hormones because I felt like as a woman um, navigating the medical field, I was often overlooked or kind of like my symptoms were a little bit brushed under the rug when I would go to different doctors or um, I just felt like they really weren't listening to me or like really hearing me. And so then I kind of went through my own personal crash and burn, honestly, that's what it was, is a, a burnout, and went to a naturopathic doctor that I knew from school. She was one of my instructors, actually, and uh, really through her helping me through my um, hypothyroidism, from her helping me rebalance my own female hormones and getting off hormonal birth control, I noticed how good I felt, and that's really what got me hooked on wanting to help other women through similar things. That's so great. I love your personal story. Um, and I love what you said too about having a long-term plan in place. So not, you know, I think a lot of people go to their doctor and they have 
maybe a type of thyroidism and they're just going to be on thyroid medicine their entire life. And that's really their only plan. And they'll keep getting tested where you have an approach. Yes, the client based on where they're at may need some conventional medicine, but then let's have a plan in place and work on healing from the inside out. So yeah. And some people, some people want to stay on medication for the rest of their life and that's perfectly okay. Um, And I always say like, whatever your goal is, my goal is the same. I might have a little bit alterations to your goal to keep you safe and healthy today, but obviously whatever your goal is, let's work towards it. And sometimes there are instances where, you know, reversing a severe hypothyroidism isn't really, you can't really do that with um, out some conventional medicine or you can, but you might not like the way you feel. So I think that the like moral of that story or moral of where I'm going here is basically whatever you want to do, let's figure out what's realistic, what can happen, how are we going to make that happen, and then make some make some long term goals for that. So, so do you typically work um, in tandem with a conventional medicine doctor? Or are you actually able to do what a conventional medicine doctor would do? alongside what you're doing as a naturopath doctor, if that makes sense, like managing certain patients. We are in Minnesota. My only limitation is I can't prescribe medication. So since I can't prescribe, I also can't help you come off of them without your conventional doctor wanting to work with us. Um, Quite honestly, I was working Work, trying my best, honestly, to get out, reach out to their primary care, writing a lot of referral letters, making a lot of phone calls. And I just kind of felt like there was a lot of roadblocks. Not a lot of people are willing to work with you. Um, they're either overworked, they're just busy, or they don't understand what you're trying to do or why you want to do it. And so, because it's kind of out of the norm and they just, they just don't do it. They won't work with you. So quite honestly, I have been working towards, and I did this past year, actually hire my own a nurse practitioner who works with us. And she's amazing. She's doing her functional medicine certification. And so really, if your if their primary care isn't willing to work with me, and if they're not willing to help advance us towards the patient's goals, then we find someone else for them to help with advance those goals. So um, it's always my ultimate. I would love to work with everyone's primary care and think that everyone's just going to, you know, help and want to get these people off statins and want to get them, you know, off of high blood pressure medications. And um, if they need oral progesterone, putting them on some, you know, bioidentical hormones, but not everyone's willing to work with you. Well, can you share a little bit about the, how you work with people and the services that you provide? And just curious right now with COVID and everything, are you working with people virtually? So for those listeners who are outside of the Twin Cities. Um, yeah. Um, I would say majority of our practice is the Twin Cities based, probably 90% plus. Um, we do have some people who come in from other Midwestern states like North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Iowa. Um, but mo- majority of the time people will see us in person for their first visit. And during that first visit, um, it's really about information gathering. So our health histories, um, the way that I take them is we start from birth until now. So we're talking about, you know, um, someone's hormonal history. We're starting at puberty. We're really starting, even if you're 55 or you're, you know, 25, it doesn't matter. We're starting at puberty. How were your periods then? What was your, um, you know, your history with hormonal birth control? A lot of times nowadays, people start really young and they get off of them in their late twenties, early thirties, um, to try to have kids. And that's generally when I start to see them as kind of in that time frame. But Uh, During that initial visit, it's really about how much, like, learning everything that I can about them. What's their family history? How much alcohol are they drinking? What's the stress like at their job? Um, What are they eating? Um, And really digging into more of the symptom picture as well. So someone says they have anxiety. Well, what time of the month are you having that anxiety? What's that anxiety derived from? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Is it worse in the morning? Is it worse at night? Um, what have you tried to fix it? So really working through a lot of my questions surrounding one symptom and then moving on to the next. And that generally, uh, it takes a long time, but we schedule about 90 minutes, an hour and a half for that conversation to really work through what's really going on, trying to find uh, more clues that would point to an underlying cause and then start to work some of that up. So I also um, like to get data 
and I like to be really data driven in my approach because I feel like if you know what's going on and you have the proper diagnosis, you can find amazing evidence based research based um, therapies that can help overcome it. So um, at the end of that first visit is when we say, do you have enough data for us to really start working towards uh, or, you know, giving you therapies or giving you supplements, giving you nutrients, giving you herbs that can help overcome your issues, or do we need more information? So, hmm. so it sounds very thorough, unlike a conventional medical doctor where you walk in and you may see your doctor for 10, 15 minutes and they ask yeah. you a few questions, you fill out a checklist, maybe they read it, maybe they don't. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, some, quite honestly, um, I've even talked to people that have gone to their conventional doctor and been like, you just sound depressed. And when I talk to them, they sound apathetic and sad and burnt out, not depressed. They sound adrenally fatigued. And mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think it's a neurotransmitter imbalance that's causing them to feel this sadness. It's the fact that they don't have enough coping mechanisms to deal with all their stress. They have depleted their cortisol so far down that they're walking zombies. And it's not depression we're working with. We're working with apathy and adrenal fatigue. And so you can kind of even take similar symptoms that would point to conventional diagnoses and reroute them towards, you know, another place in their endocrine system or another root cause. You're so, so true. And so I know you talked about data. So how is that next step after the initial consultation? How yeah. do you obtain that data through yeah. testing and yeah, we do. Um, we do a fair amount of testing. So we can test anything you want us to. So we can do stool, urine, breath, uh, I don't do hair, but saliva. So you can do almost anything to find out what we want. And um, how I really go about it is what question do I want answered? You know, if you're having irregular cycles or they're really heavy or you're having a lot of PMS, you're coming off hormonal birth control, we want to do a hormone panel. We have a bunch of options for that. I typically will do blood um, or a Dutch test. And Dutch is a urine-based hormone test that will test urinary metabolites of hormones. So it'll tell us how they're being processed in your body really cool, really gives a lot of good information, very expensive. So then it's that conversation of where do we want to allocate our monetary resources? And um, that's a whole separate conversation that, you know, you get to have with people because we are not inside the medical system. So we are cash-based and um, out of network for a lot of people or for everyone actually. And um, figuring out how we're going to obtain that data in the most resource responsible way. A lot of, so, a lot of blood is, I guess, yeah, to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the symptoms or conditions that you see most often in your practice and who would you say is your kind of ideal client and wh where are they on their health and wellness journey when they get to you? Yeah. Um, I would say my mass majority of my patients are 35 to 45 year old women, um, either usually postpartum uh, to whether that be one year, two years, five years postpartum. Um, and they're working with um, a lot of burnout, a lot of fatigue, um, a lot of stubborn weight gain or, or weight that just won't come off. Um, I get a lot of anxious patients. Um, and quite honestly, they're very, very burnt out from stretching themselves very thin for a very long time. Um, and they come in, yeah, with uh, anxiety, fatigue, insomnia. And how long would you say you typically work with someone like that before they feel, hopefully they're walking away at some point, <laughs> kind of feeling their best, right? Absolutely. How, how long would you say that process works? It depends. It takes, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, it depends. I would say that I have some patients who are very just depleted, very depleted. And it could take, you know, it, it took them 10 years to get to that spot um, of being very depleted. Mm -hmm. I don't know any magic wand that can reverse it in six months or even a year. Um, so really working with us is setting that foundation and teaching you how to take care of yourself. And yes, we're talking about what supplements can we take to uh, move biochemistry and what supplements can you take to balance hormones, et cetera. Um, but we're really trying to set that foundation for your next decade, for your next two to three decades and taking care of yourself because it will take a lot of time to reverse um, that level of burnout. So, And I think that's something that like Marnie and I see all the time in our individual health coaching practices is people want a quick fix. And so they yeah. want a pill or like just 
give me a diet, tell me what to eat, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. I just want to get rid of the belly weight. But you have to think about the fact that this has been going on potentially since childhood, you know, depending on what medicines you may have been on, even as a baby or right, an infant. And so to say 10, 20, 30 years, you know, now you're in your 30s and you're having this burnt out, it's not going to happen overnight that you can reverse all these symptoms. Right. Um, and, and so what do you see, or I'd be curious to know just your you know, advice, like how do you motivate people to realize that it, it, you're, we're in it for the long haul. And to your point, you want to focus on the next 10, 20, 30 years of your life and having a good quality of life and being healthy for the duration. Um, yeah. But that's a hard conversation sometimes to have with people. Keeping pe- people are very, it's, it's never a, a needing to convince them up front because they usually come in and they're super motivated and they really want to do it and they're really excited. Um, it's keeping them on the bandwagon yeah. mm-hmm. um, because after the sexy wears off and really you're like, okay, this is the third month on this particular like eating pattern, um, whatever they're doing, you know, I've been focusing on all these things. I think one of the ways that I keep them motivated is we do check in on labs um, generally every four, three to four months. Um, And we just check in on progress to make sure that what we're doing is working. It's actually changing biochemistry and that we're actually, um, you know, it's tangible evidence of you're doing a great job and you're working really hard to make these changes. And look, this number proves that. Um, So I do think that that helps keep people motivated um, to continue on is when, when you can tangibly see that things are moving in the right direction. Absolutely. And hopefully they're feeling a little bit better too, even if it's not, you know, a hundred percent. So they're feeling baby steps, right? This is all about baby steps. I always take the approach too of like, if your health is like a ship and you've got a ton of holes in that ship and it is sinking fast. um, The first thing that we have to do is band-aid the outside. I mean, whatever that takes, you know, if you're feeling hypothyroid and your number support needing medication, like I am more than happy to just band-aid that ship and we can start healing it from the inside and then eventually take those band-aids off and that ship will stay afloat. Um, And I think that's what makes people feel better faster. Um, You know, I'm the first to say, okay, um, ashwagandha is great, but you're a little more depleted than what ashwagandha is going to make you feel better mm-hmm. with. Like, let's go for the panex ginseng or, you know, let's go for the adrenoglandular or let's go for something a little bit more um, intense than we, I typically, you know, would. And then um, from that point, we can start to wean off and we can start to like draw back, but um, let's get you functioning like a normal human being today and get you walking around feeling good. And then, you know, we'll start to wean back off and look like what maintenance looks like. Well, and it's interesting because I find with my clients that, you know, they're fine, they're happy to take the supplements or whatever, but they just, they think the supplements are going to solve all their problems when actually, you know, you may need a daily meditation practice, or you may need to cut down some of the, on some of the um, responsibilities that you have in your life, because you are at such a high level of burnout. And unless you change your lifestyle, you know, those things are not going to go away. (laughs) Those issues. (laughs) Yep. Um, And that's an interesting conversation to have with people as well, especially when you get the really type A, really successful, really highly driven. And you're like, well, you know, perhaps you might need to take a vacation. And they look at you like, what are you talking about? Just give me a supplement that will make me feel better. And I'll just go back to work. And um, those are interesting conversations to have with people and with a variable success. So, I seem to yeah. attract a lot of those type of clients. <laughs> I do too, actually. So. <laughs> I was just going to say, I have one this summer. It was like, oh, yeah. vacation? I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> a few days. And then finally she went away for three days and she said it was the most amazing trip. And she didn't check her email and she connected with you know her family and it was wonderful. And like, literally you're just having, telling someone to take a vacation. I mean, that's, you know. Yeah. I mean, oh, it I doesn't can... even need to be anything like extravagant or expensive. Drive up north for like two days or something. I always say if I can write a prescription for eat, pray, love, like done. Oh, yes. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I love that book and movie. I, I just, need to I... Italy and Bali and every in India right now. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I want to do that trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just use your uh, HSA dollars for it, right? If it's a, if it's a medically necessary. Exactly. Yes. Maybe one day we'll get work there. research, <laughs> Stephanie. Research, yeah, trips, exactly. right? <laughs> oh, I would love to. Um, so, diving. We talk a little bit about hormones, but can we just almost back up a bit and explain? You know, at a high level, I think everyone knows what hormones are, um, 
at a high level, but can you explain like the critical role that they play in their health and kind of what does it mean to have balanced hormones? Like, what does that even mean? Yeah. So hormone is a really general term. So hormone is just a chemical messenger, whether that hormone be insulin and it's telling glucose to come into your cells, whether that hormone is progesterone and it's telling um, that endometrial layer to stay really thick and not shed yet and grow a baby, or, you know, that hormone is leptin and it's telling your brain that you have adequate energy. So hormone is a pretty broad term that doesn't always just mean female hormones um, or biologically female hormones. Um, So when we talk about in the context of like biologically female hormones of estrogen and progesterone, um, balanced, can, it does have a, uh, a value, like a critical value on labs. You can see, we like to see a 10 to one ratio of estrogen to progesterone during days 19 through 21 of your cycle. Um, but that also means that um, you are, I don't want to say symptom free because some level of premenstrual symptoms can be a little bit normal. Um, Intense, you know, taking days off work, absolutely not normal, but um, it depends on the, the number depends on the person, right? If you feel really good and your progesterone's an 11 and not a 15 where I like to see it, then that's great. That's your personal normal. So um, balanced really has a numerical value and it also has a, uh, a personal, how you feel when your hormones are that level type of value. So So what are some symptoms you see um, in women when their hormones are out of balance? Yeah. So for, I'll I'll categorize that and I'll talk about which whenever you'd like, but um, cycling women is typically easier to to reference because a lot of your symptoms revolve around when your hormones are at their biggest shifts. So your biggest shifts are going to be ovulation. Um, and around ovulation, if you are starting to feel um, like ovulatory pain or your cervical mucus um, changes in a way that um, is really copious or has a bad odor to it, or um, you're feeling more lethargic, um, that could be some sort of ovulatory dysfunction, whether the egg quality is poor or the, just the strength isn't there. Um, but typically when we talk about it, the fun things to talk about are what happens right before your period, um, that premenstrual, that right before you bleed week, um, with unbalanced hormones, you see a lot of irritability, um, snapping at people when you typically wouldn't snap, uh, (laughs) at them. Um, acne is a really big one. So around the mouth and chin, right by the nasolabial folds, right by your nose and on your T-zone is typical for, um, is typical for estrogen-based acne. Uh, a lot of people's sleep becomes really disturbed. So uh, whether you're waking up at two to three o'clock in the morning and just can't go back to bed or have a difficult time falling asleep, that's a typical, that's a symptom of estrogen dominance or not having enough progesterone. Um, and other ones would be breast tenderness, being really fatigued, trying to like pull things out the top of my head, but that's the fun time to talk to people about what's happening in their cycle. Um, some people will get headaches, menstrual migraines, Uh, when they have too much estrogen, but that's where getting the blood labs is really important because the symptoms of estrogen dominance and having too much estrogen sound exactly the same as having low progesterone. So, and you know, one thing that I learned in some of my studies, and I took a hormone health course a few years ago, I think a lot of people just assume that these PMS symptoms are normal. Like, I mean, back to my high school days, I was just popping Advil and Midol for these symptoms. And that's what, you know, we all did. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't addressing the root cause of anything. Right. And we just have grown to live with some of these symptoms. And you mentioned like missing work and that that's not normal. Right. So what's, you know, what are some signs that your, that your hormones are out of balance and not just, you know, sort of normal symptoms before your period, or should any of this happen if your hormones are balanced? Cause I right. think, you know, and, and what, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about even just, um, some things that you would recommend people do even before they would get um, potential lab testing. Yeah. So with balance, a normal cycle should look like very minimal cramping. It can be very normal for when you start to shed that endometrial lining to have minimal cramping. Um, Having looser stools is very normal. Um, The prostaglandins released can make you have a little bit, um, you know, your bowels to work a little bit faster. Um, And then, uh, 
when you are on your period, it's obviously normal to have, you know, four to five days in length, but actually where people um, will say, oh, my bleeding is normal uh, when their bleeding is actually very heavy, you're only supposed to bleed about 30 to 60 milliliters in an entire week. Uh, which actually looks like uh, a regular tampon saturated all the way through is 10 milliliters. So that is three to six regular tampons an entire week where some women are like, I'm wow. doing two super pluses at the same time, plus a super pad, or wow. you know, they're changing a regular tampon every hour. Um, and they're just like, oh, that's normal for me. And it might be normal for you, but it's not, um, that is not a normal amount. So what can... So I, Stephanie and I both have teenage daughters. What can we do as mothers of teenage daughters to get them kind of started on a path of having healthy periods at a young age? Because I think, you know, it's kind of like this rite of passage almost with the teens. Oh, I'm having this really bad period. I have bad cramps. Is um, it really? <laughs> I'm going to stay home and miss school. Or, you know, there's kind of like this girls club, I don't know what you want to call it, where they all kind of commiserate about their periods and their cramps and their moods and whatever. But really, I think it would be nice to break that. And yeah. I always tell my kids, don't eat sugar when you're having your period. Like don't eat sugar, eat the healthiest food you can eat, drink lots of water. But what else would you recommend? I didn't even know that there was like a commiserating girls club. There was I was too embarrassed to tell my friends that I started my period. So maybe times have changed. They've um, definitely changed. Yeah. Well, I think people are just more open and vocal. Now everyone's yes. sharing everything, right? They share everything. Yes. Okay. Um, I think one thing that's really important for like newly cycling teenage girls is going to be uh, figuring out because it's going to be so different. The first year after you start your period can be extremely random. And that's just your body trying to figure out its ovulatory patterns um, and figuring out what is your body's normal. And that first year is really difficult to establish. So at that point, just trying to create a rhythm, whether that be with seed cycling. Um, so you've heard of seed cycling before where you take two different types of seeds, some that are more phytoestrogenic and some that are more um, pro progesterone every other week and uh, really trying to create that cycle. Um, other things that are going to encourage ovulation is going to be lowering your insulin levels. So like you said, not eating sugar um, or even I don't, I, and I'm going to say the word heavy carbohydrates, but I, I am not a proponent of low carb, um, like extremely low carb, really. Um, so eating adequate like amounts of fiber and healthy carbohydrates that are like quinoas, whole wheat pastas, um, to keep your blood sugar stable and lower your insulin values is going to help your ovula ovulation become more established. Um, and then also doing things that will help your liver health. So cruciferous vegetables get, you know, kind of the um, spotlight for having a lot of DIM and I3C, which are estrogen metabolizers. And they're very good at metabolizing estrogens um, through your liver and out your bowels. And they also provide a lot of fiber. Um, but just working on establishing those first, uh, that first year of figuring out your period. And then from there, um, yeah, I, 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 guess I really work, I really do work a lot with labs because progesterone deficiency is not as common in really young women as it is in their 20s and 30s. Um, and a lot of high estrogen levels, I found hypothyroidism in quite a few abnormal cycling young women um, and kind of looking at it from a more other, like how does your endocrine system match up with, or how does it you know integrate with your female hormone cycle? That's okay. So you mentioned seed cycling, which actually was a question I wanted to ask. I actually sure. started doing it a few months ago. So you, you would recommend seed cycling even at a very young age? I would. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's flax, chia, and pumpkin seeds are the phytoestrogenic piece. Mm -hmm. And you're eating those for two weeks. And typically that starts on day one and ends on day 13. And really the, the key ticket here that I don't think very, gets 
talked about enough is the fact that you really want the oil on the inside of the seed. Like the case, like the fiber that's in the seed is great and it'll help you, you know, poop better. But um, really what you want is that oil on the inside. So freshly grinding them, whether that be with your teeth and chewing them really well before you swallow them or freshly grinding them about every three days before the oil goes rancid um, and using it that way is going to be kind of the ticket there. So when you talk about seed cycling, um, some of our listeners, this may be the first time they're even hearing that term. Okay. Can you just give a quick explanation of it? And also when you say flax, chia, and pumpkin days one through 13, are you saying like a cup, a, a teaspoon? Like, can you yeah. explain that a little further? Sure. So on a macroscopic view, seed cycling is using seeds that have hormone balancing properties, whether that be pro-estrogen and pro-progesterone, to create a 28-day cycle um, with seeds. So your body has these hormone receptors. Um, no matter who you are, you have estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, and you're using the seeds as very um, mild, um, you know, mild agonists for, you know, mild... Uh, <laughs> What's the word for that? This is the postpartum pregnancy brain here. Um, like seeds that uh, will help stimulate progesterone or will help satisfy those progesterone receptors. Um, you're using seeds to help do that uh, when your own body might not be making enough. And it can help put you, your body into a regular cycle. So um, that's the essence of seed cycling is using different types of seeds. So flax, chia, and pumpkin seeds at two tablespoons if you're having regular... Uh, regular cycles, not irregular, regular cycles um, during days one. So day one is the day you start bleeding of your cycle until day 13 is just 13 days later from that day one. So is this something you recommend for someone who has irregular cycles, not for someone who has a cycle? It comes I do it every both. 20. Oh, you do, you do it no matter what. Um, it depends. A lot of people like food-based options for helping balance their hormones or creating more, um, getting higher levels of hormones like progesterone. So actually I do use it quite often as a food-based way to help balance hormones, regardless if they're, if they're regular or irregular. So it can help if your periods are quote regular, but you have symptoms, you know, yeah. the cramping and maybe really heavy periods and that sort of thing. Yep. And I know it can also help potentially spark a period in someone who isn't getting theirs or who's lost yep. a period. Yep. Um, and it's really just from personal experience. It's not, it seems a little overwhelming and daunting. Um, and I, I know we talked about days one to 13 and 14 to 28. That's the sunflower and the sesame, I think. Yes. Sunflower right? and sesame, two tablespoons. Right. But you know, I put them in a smoothie or I will put them on a salad too, but the smoothie, then it gets freshly ground up and yeah. Um, um, when I and was doing it, honestly, I just had them by the front door in this like little uh, cup and I would just grab like a little handful as I was walking out the door and as I'm yeah. walking down my stairs, just like eating them and walking out to the grass and finishing them off. So I made it very simple because I, doing it difficult wasn't going to, but yeah, people make like the protein balls out of them, put them in smoothies, um, put them in other like nice, cool recipes you could find for seed cycling. I, I didn't do that. Yeah. So do you find, I'm just curious, like, have yeah. you tested someone before seed cycling and afterwards, and have you seen an actual difference in their hormone health? I have not. No, okay. I've never used it to, I've never used it like in lieu of uh, like other herbs or supplements that could help balance hormones. That's a good okay. idea. Never tried it though. Just curious. Yeah. 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 I usually go based on symptoms or mm -hmm. um, someone who's coming off of hormonal birth control. We can't um, do the test their female hormones for about 60 to 90 days after they have come off of it. So oftentimes I will use it during that time um, to get people, um, if it based, especially if it's estrogen-based birth control, um, to reestablish their cycles, reestablish ovulation, and then even help with the fiber to detoxify some of those estrogens out of their system. Yeah, that's great. That's super helpful. So, so really having your monthly cycle or your monthly period should be a non-event, right? You should have no cramps. You shouldn't have the mood swings, the bloating. It should just kind of be something that you do for a few, you bleed for a few days and you move on. Is that yeah. the idea? I say it should be a non-event as it shouldn't disrupt your life. Like I should be able, like I could be having period cramps right now and you should never know. Um, you know, it should be able to be, be well hidden and not necessarily um, like, uh, like adversely affecting what you're doing. 
So Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to stop my conversation every like few seconds and hold myself, like hold my abdomen and then keep talking. I should be able to carry on a full conversation. But you still may have some of the cramping. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty common when you're trying, when that, you know, the layer is trying to shed itself that you'll have a little bit of cramping to help get, get it out and open up the cervix and allow some of it out. So yeah, it's normal to have a little bit, but it should really be a non-event. Yeah. So shifting gears just a little bit. Um, we thought maybe we'd even ask just about COVID's going on right now. Um, love to hear your thoughts on, you know, maybe managing symptoms if you do test positive and also preventative measures. There's obviously a big, lots of discussion right now with immunity and boosting your immune health. And so what are you, you know, suggesting and recommending to your patients right now? Yeah. Um, I'm more focused on the prevention and stimulating their immune system. Um, I haven't really researched a whole lot about getting into the thick of how to treat COVID naturally. Um, But for boosting your immune system, I also uh, be really specific about autoimmune patients versus non-autoimmune patients um, because some of the herbs that you use can boost your immune system and put you into some sort of autoimmune flare, whether that be Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, um, lupus, whatever that may be. Some of those herbs are contraindicated. Um, But right now I'm really recommending heavy vitamin D. So um, in patients who know their values, uh, 50,000 I use once per week, and then typically 10,000 I use once per day um, on top of that. We're actually getting into doing injectable vitamin D um, for patients who are deficient and not absorbing it well. So a lot of us have malabsorptive issues because of SIBO, gut dysbiosis, leaky gut in general, and can't absorb a lot of that vitamin D going to this critical time. So we are starting to do injectable vitamin D. Um, How are you injecting that? Right into the right into your arm. But is it like uh, an infusion or is it a shot? Or it's an like IM a- injection. It's just intramuscular. So yeah, it's, it's vitamin D3, uh, cholecalciferol put into an oil base, and then you just draw it up in a vial into a syringe and then inject it like you would a flu shot or okay. you know, B, so it's a vitamin quick shot. Injection. Or- it's not like you're sitting there for 30 minutes getting a no. constant. Yeah, no, it doesn't go into the vein. It just goes into the muscle. Okay. Okay. And yeah. how often are, are people that maybe have malabsorption issues, how often do they have to get an injection? Um, well, research shows that it's safe up to about 600,000 IUs uh, once every few months, which is a wow. lot. Wow. Uh, we, yeah. are, we are not going to do it that high, but um, typically about 150,000 IUs once per month, up to 300,000 IUs once per month, um, and then rerunning labs at about three months. Um, and the research shows that even the 300,000 they did on one study just at the very beginning and tested them four, six, and 12 months later. And even four months later, their values were still, um, above 30 was their, um, was their marker that they were looking at. Would we like it closer to 50 to 80? Um, so we are going to do it for three months and then recheck. So, okay. And so you're not giving those shots to people that you haven't checked their vitamin D levels. We, we will. It's just that um, we want to be more safe than sorry. On yeah, those. absolutely. Like we'll give a lower dose than the people who we just absolutely know their values for. So and anything we, else with respect to immune system that you oh, recommend? Yeah. Um, yeah. We are doing, uh, we are recommending higher dose vitamin C. So two to three grams per day, even up to five grams if bowel tolerance will allow. Um, echinacea is a generally well, uh, well established for autoimmune or non-autoimmune patient. Um, zinc, um, zinc, I never say this word right. I don't know. Pinkalate. I think it's like pinkalate. Pinkalate, pick you, I don't know. Yeah, that one with the P (laughs) on it. Um, that zinc, um, or zinc chelate is one that we are recommending more. Um, we prefer it to have copper in there with it, zinc, copper, ratios um, so that you don't deplete one or the other, but um, zinc will definitely help stimulate an immune system response. So if someone's just taking zinc, do you think that won't have the same effect as the zinc, zinc pinkolate, picolate, however you say it? <laughs> um, it depends on the form. So there's like zinc oxide, there's uh, zinc, I think it's zinc citrus, Carn- no, zinc carnosine, and that's for like uh, your stomach health and mm-hmm. your gastrointestinal lining. So I do think it matters when it comes to like what you want it to do is being specific on the form. Um, 
I would, yeah, I would go for the zinc piclinate. And what about going back to the vitamin C? I've heard, you know, some people say straight vitamin C. Some people say the alkali alkalizing vitamin C. The buffered. C. Yep. Any um, thoughts on that? I, so if you're doing it short term, I don't like, I would rather it not be buffered. I'd rather just do straight ascorbic acid in a powdered form or a pill form. I don't really mind. Uh, if you're going to do it long term in powder, it can corrode the enamel of your teeth. Um, the, just the plain ascorbic acid can. So I would recommend if you're doing it long term to do it buffered. Um, but your, your stomach is supposed to be acidic. It's not supposed to be alkaline or, you know, buffered in any way. So I, I typically just re recommend straight ascorbic acid. Interesting. So, yeah, we have to uh, buff that or bump that up again in, in my household, especially as we head into the winter months. So Damn, that's I really just dug good. mine out of my cabinet. Um, I have like a graveyard of things that just yeah. sit in my linen cabinet mm -hmm. and I just dig them out when the season approaches. So, and that in my, um, uh, like immune system mushrooms. So, Oh, which what ones do you take? Which, which I do a formula mushrooms? called bio veg by, or super bio veg by priority one. Um, I believe it has shiitake, mayaki, reishi in it. I, um, it's, I could Google it, but it's a really great blend. And I'll take just like daily, like one capsule, um, just for immune system support. But then when you, if you do get sick, um, even with non COVID things, you right. can take a lot more of them for a shorter period of time, like seven days, every couple of hours, you can take some and really just boost your immune system. It's kind of like a natural antibiotic. So, so oh, well, yeah. we'll if you're it. sick, Obviously, you want to keep taking these things. Is there anything you'd add to the mix? What do you think I, of elderberry? I like elderberry. It's better for prevention than it is for, it can inhibit viral replication. So it's going to be better for prevention rather than treatment. Um, I would go more on the like mushroom, if you got sick, more on the mushroom route, more on the echinacea, depending on if you're pregnant and breastfeeding, things like golden seal, astragalus, um, yeah, uh, those would be probably the biggest things that I'd, I'd reach towards. I really like the super bio veg. I keep, always keep a bottle in my house um, for when the man flu hits and we have to, this was pre-baby, now he gets sick, but you know, when my husband gets sick, it's always like start dosing him. So, yeah. And yeah. do you notice that it, does it, would you say shorten the life of the sickness or make the sickness less? Like, are you less sick or you know what I mean? It's yeah. not as intense. Like what, what, what do you notice from that? Um, I notice in him that when he starts to complain about, he like, you know, gets the body aches and starts to feel really lethargic. I'll start dosing him that day and it'll typically be gone by the next day. Um, and which is really cool. But even if I've taken it when I actually got sick and it definitely shortened the life that I felt like it was going to be a bad one. I think this was two years ago. Um, and it, I maybe was, was sick for like two to three days versus my guesstimate. If I hadn't taken it, probably would have been almost a week. So okay, that's awesome. We will definitely link that up for people in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. I just sent my son off to college with vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc. Yep. Um, and I'm like, make sure you're taking this stuff. But now I'm thinking maybe I should add a little echinacea to the mix and some mushrooms yeah. for if he does get sick. Yeah. Exactly. Uh -huh. He can be a dispensary in his uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> house. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, Lord knows that these college kids need it, right? Uh, right. Yeah. yeah, I was, um, I don't know if this will date me, but I was in college when H1N1 broke out and I was living in the dorms at that time and my roommate got it. Um, and I did, I never got it, but she, she did, she got the bad H1 and wow. so, and I, I didn't do. know anything about natural products at that time. So I was zero help to her, but you were um, just lucky. <laughs> I was just lucky, but every one of the dorm, it was like, it was a germ a cesspool. I mean, everyone's just sharing germs. Right? I remember when our kids all got sent home from school during that time, like the school shut down. Oh, really? Um, during H1N1. Yep. I remember our school shut down for like a good week. And they just like clean the school. My kids were really little. I don't Dang. remember how many years ago that was, but I remember that so clearly. Yeah. No, we still had class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we didn't get out of that, but yeah, no, people were, it was, it was bad. So. Yeah. Um, 
So we'd love for you to share maybe like a success story of someone that came into your practice with severe symptoms, maybe a hormonal imbalance, or even like gut dysbiosis. And just after working with you, what, you know, maybe share the results that they saw. Yeah. I actually have a favorite page, one of my favorite patient stories. Um, I know she's listening to this and she'll identify herself, but um, PCOS is one of my favorite things to treat because the cycle, there's so much you can do in natural medicine to help regulate the cycles a little bit better, to decrease symptoms of, you know, excess testosterone, excess insulin. Um, There's a lot of natural things that you can do. And really the only conventional options that they have are birth control, which if you want to get pregnant or trying to get pregnant is counterproductive. Um, Yeah, that's kind of the only option that you get. Metformin, uh, is typically given. So one of my favorite patient stories is a PCOS patient cycle. Can you about- quickly just say what that is for people that don't know? Oh, sure. Yeah. PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, typically patients have irre- really irregular cycles. Um, this particular patient has cycle once a quarter. So every three months and um, along with that, they typically have symptoms of high testosterone, so hair growth in unwanted places like your upper lip, um, sideburns, and a lot of cystic acne. So under the jawline, under the jawline on your neck, chest, shoulders, and back, and as well as insulin resistance, which makes them gain a lot of weight, which have abnormal blood sugars. Um, yeah, it, it's a pretty, it puts a damper on people's, uh, you know, hormonal life and kind of makes them feel pretty crappy. Um, my favorite patient who had PCOS actually, um, having periods about once a quarter and using one of those like aura, yeah, aura rings that we could track her temperatures and we could see when she would ovulate and how that would stay, uh, how her progesterone would stay elevated over a certain period of time. Um, we used only supplements. So we did a lot of gut healing, um, supplements. We did things like Vitex and NAC, inositol. Um, to help regulate ovulation and get it to come every um, 28 days, or that was our goal. Um, I think if I'm remembering, I don't have her chart, but if I'm remembering right, we got it down to about 30, every 33 days, she was having a period. Um, And then she went on vacation and, you know, decided that they were going to try to have a baby and it worked on the first try. And she is actively pregnant. I think she's due probably here in the next month which is really cool because PCOS notoriously has high rates of infertility. That's a Um, great story. Yeah. And it can be, it took us a little while. So uh, it probably took us nine months, maybe seven to nine months um, to really get of just consistency. And she is the most consistent person that I probably know in my life, more consistent than I could ever be probably. And she would take them religiously every single day at the same time. She ate so well. She took very good care of herself. She had a high stress job, but really tried hard to practice self-care and mitigate her stressors. And um, it worked. And we got her cycles down to about 33 days and yeah, she got pregnant. That's That's so amazing and so cool to really see like the results like that. And it really does show you that like reducing your stress, eating well, doing all those things, really taking care of yourself makes a huge difference. Yeah. Well, I feel, I feel like I know a lot of people that tried to get pregnant, you know, many years ago and had fertility issues and they were just put on various, you know, whatever treatments to have a baby. And in retrospect, I think a lot of them, it was stress. And had, had they maybe been told to eat better and take a step back from your stress and work on that, I wonder what would have happened differently. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing, Marnie. And you, you mentioned like, oh, it took nine months, but I know people that tried for years to get pregnant mm-hmm. and do IVF and so many other more invasive treatments that nine months of what you just discussed is actually not really that long when you want to have a baby. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. And my, I mean, even my sister had a hard time conceiving and we, I don't even think we did a hormone panel on her because she was trying to conceive like yesterday. Uh, This was a year ago, but, um, she, hers was just, we gave her some progesterone, progesterone support. And within a month she conceived. Um, and I think that she was so stressed out from not being able to conceive. It just tanks your endocrine system. Mm-hmm. I mean, if your body sees the world outside as, you know, lots of famine and disease and stress, and why, why would you, why would it want to bring any sort of human into that world? It just won't. So, um, 
you know, IVF is a lot of pressure and I, IUI is a lot of pressure on someone. It really can make them uh, very, very anxious and very, very stressed out to where it's going to be very difficult, even with those measures to get pregnant. Right. Well, it's a counterintuitive. And I think the stress too, is like, well, it's very expensive to do that. So then you're yeah. really focused on trying to get pregnant and yeah. yeah, that could be a whole nother conversation, right? Just, <laughs> yep. <laughs> just talking about infertility. Yep. So where can people find you on social media? How can people work with you in town or if they're out of town? Yeah. Um, our, our Instagram is really our virtual business card. We, quite honestly, that's where I spend a lot of my time and a lot of um, my effort really just dispensing any sort of education that I possibly can think of in that day. Um, I really work hard to make sure that our Instagram is very informational and um, just helps you realize that there's a better way or a different way to do things than maybe you thought possible. Um, so our Instagram is MPLS, like Minneapolis, Integrative MC. Uh, and that's where you'll find us uh, every day, Monday through Friday. Oh, we do have a monthly blog too, but we usually post those to our Instagram as well. And um, those are more of the long form educational things about estrogen metabolism or what's a normal cycle or what are the best period products or, um, you know, how to green your house. And you do have a beautiful Instagram feed and it's all those things that you said. It's, so I think anyone out there, regardless of where you are in the world, definitely give them a follow because um, you'll, you'll learn a lot. And we, we work with people kind of from everywhere. It, if they're outside of Minnesota and they don't establish care in person first, it does change a little bit the relationship that we have because we're more of consultants rather than doctors. Mm -hmm. um, but we can still work with people out of state. And um, we do right, we are doing virtual um, for in person as well as uh, so new patient as well as follow up patients. Um, before we were kind of limited by. Um, if you don't establish care in person, you typically, we can't be your provider. We couldn't reimburse, your insurance couldn't reimburse you for our care. We couldn't be your doctor. But now that COVID has hit and a lot of these regulations to Medicare have been lifted, we can do in person, for, I'm sorry, virtual new patient visits, um, which is helpful. But um, yeah, we do come to our beautiful office in Northeast. And you mentioned earlier when we were chatting that you We'll offer like a 15 minute oh, yeah, yeah. consult. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, we offer a free 15 minute uh, consultation, kind of like a meet and greet. Um, so really what that's designed for is we want people to feel like we are a good decision for their health because quite honestly, your health is... Um, your team is your team and that we're, a, we're your partner in that, in that venture. So we want to make sure that we feel capable and able and we have experience with or we would feel comfortable with taking on your case. And we want you to feel comfortable that um, we'd be good providers for you. You like our personality, you, you know, like our, our system and our process. Um, so we just want to make on that call sure that everyone is on the same page that we would, could provide value to you because if we can't, um, Quite honestly, a lot of times, if I don't feel like I'm the best person for your case, I'm honest, I would just flat out refer you to someone who I think would be the best person for you. Um, just because healthcare is so personal. And at the end of the day, mm -hmm. everyone's goal is just to get you feeling better. And whether I'm that person or not, we want to hook you up with the person that is. So. And I love that attitude because I feel like a lot of professionals don't have that attitude. They think mm -hmm. they are the, you know the one-stop shop for everyone. And I you're think not. that you're absolutely right, that different people are going to gel with different providers. Yeah. Like sometimes I slip the occasional F-bomb on accident and <laughs> I happen to do that on your 15 and you don't like it, then I'm not the person for you. So um, yeah, I, I feel like it's also like you have to work intimately with this person, right? You have to tell them your deepest, darkest seats, like feelings and thoughts and um, mm -hmm confess when you don't handle your stress well and you can't say face for me because if you say face for me then I can't help you um that really we have to jive like we have to we become friends quite honestly because we um I have to get to know you on that level to be able to make measurable changes I love that and I don't think that that ex that relationship exists with a lot of healthcare providers so yeah. Well, that relationship takes time too. So 10 minutes once a year or 10 minutes every few months, like who gets, right. who gets to know you in 10 minutes? Um, so yeah. 
definitely spend a lot of time like working on just like getting to know you, getting to know your family, getting to know your kids, getting to know your work life. And I mean, how can I give you advice if I don't know those things? Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that. So Dr. Cassie, one final question that we like to ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Yeah. So um, a big lesson that I've been learning recently, and I think really defines to me what the art of living well would be is as women, we have all of these different balls that we like to juggle. So health, work, immediate family, um, you know, in-laws, et cetera. We have all these balls that we're always trying to juggle. And um, we start to, you know, feel like we're failures if we can't handle all these different balls or if we drop them. And quite honestly, this lesson that I'm learning currently is just when, when to ask for help, um, especially when it comes to your health, is that you don't have to do it all alone. You don't have to get a Dr. Google MD degree and, you know, pick out all these different treatments that might make you feel better. Um, and just being able to feel comfortable reaching out and asking for help if you, if you do with self-care, with natural treatments, with conventional treatments, whatever that means. Um, and, you know, not give up if you do happen to lose one of the balls or drop them. Oh, that's beautiful. We've all been there. And um, it's so important to know when to ask for help. Like, I think women especially really struggle with that. Like they want, like you said, we want to do everything ourselves. We want to succeed in all areas of our life. And to just take that step back and know when to ask for help is huge. Yeah, it is. And I found myself doing it this week. Yes. And I think that's something that probably as a new mom that you're realizing more yeah. Maybe, and then that you did, you know, three or four months ago. So absolutely. Yep. <laughs> I think I could empathize before when I didn't have a baby of my own. And now I very much understand. So, yeah. Well, well thank, thank you, you so, much. so much for coming yeah, this on is our thank show you. today. Um, we will link up in the show notes, all this wonderful information that you've shared with us. And we wish you all the best with your new baby. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll have to have you come on and dive into one of these other topics um, on another episode. Absolutely. That'd be fun. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for listening to the Art of Living Well podcast. We are so grateful that you joined us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or anyone else you think may benefit from this information. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and tag the Art of Living Well podcast on social media. If you want more inspiration in between episodes, you can find us on social media at the Art of Living underscore well on Instagram and Facebook, where we will share snippets from our daily lives and our journey to living well.